Okay, guys, so I'm going to start with a map where I'm looking at the human geography around your own school, but with a slightly different angle. So looking at those 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 simple field worker idea for exploring your own school grounds. So we can do this around any grounds or any place and location. So I'm just going to zoom in on the Ordnance Survey HQ. So part of my Part of the fun I had yesterday was going around the Ordnance Survey HQ, finding things I could photograph and link them to the map for show, show lo, uh, location and place around our own kind of grounds. But I've done this with a slight twist, guys. Rather than just create images, I've done them at a slight angle. So it gets your pupils out exploring around your own school grounds to look at these places and these obscured um, images I've got. So hopefully, guys, you can see my map. I'm just going to make that a little bit smaller. So what I did is I went around, as I said there, I went around, collected six images, but I took these pictures at obscure angles. So finding things that you can find around your own school ground. So it could be things like your bike sheds or uh, your, your emergency exits, et cetera, et cetera, just to give your pupils the chance to kind of explore around their own school grounds and find these things. So let's look at a couple of these pictures. So this nice green one here, I'm a bit disappointed that Laura, who's also on the call, managed to guess this at the first attempt. So I'm going to click on this one. So from an obscure angle, let's have a look at this one. So does anybody want to have a guess in the chat what this might be? Okay, when you see this image. So it's a strange angle of an image. Okay, so we've got that one. Uh, we've got one here. Another one we can view as well. So another strange strange angle of a different, a different image, again, around our location. So it's finding those obscure things for your pupils to go and explore in their own locality, which is quite a good thing to be able to do around that kind of physical geography. So the, some of the man-made things on your school grounds. So I shall, I'll talk you through what we've got here. In fact, I'll show you my other map where I've got these all together. So this time I can show you them. So there's a nice picture of the charging point, our, our war memorial, our um, emergency exit point, um, the wooden bench here, uh, the OS logo and the bike rack as well. So think of ideas to do that around your own school grounds. Something you can create or maybe you could get your key stage pupil, key stage two pupils, your year sixes to go around and collect these images for you. And then they can, you can use it in your key stage one um, geography as well. So that's one kind of idea using those kind of obscure kind of images to look around your own place and location. Mm -hmm. The next one I'm going to show you guys is one that I think would be a really nice one to do with your definitely with your younger pupils, year one, year twos. So hopefully you can see my map on the board. So this one is looking at where does everybody live, first of all. So using your map to identify place and location. So something you could do quite simply on the whiteboard of your machine, showing a, a map of where all the people live. And all we did is the all I did with this one was to make it kind of a travel map. So looking at the different ways we travel to school. So looking at how we can highlight those. So it's very simply, the red markers are marker tools that we can find on our drawing tools, which I show here. I've used these and we can color those in different colors. So we've simply done, simply done a, a red one to show people that walked into school and where they lived. We've got the blue one shows some people that drove into school. And finally, you've got some that people that rode into school. So you can plot these on the map, show where all these locations are and link in a little bit of maths using a graph. So we can make a simple bar chart to show these different areas or different ways we walked in, how many pupils traveled through through that particular mode of transport and show these all on a map. So linking in a little bit of geography again around place, location, how do we get to school, linking in your bar chart. Now with the bar chart, how we create this is it's really just a JPEG image. So within the service, we can add images on our map so we can link any image we like. Now all I've done to create this bar chart is hopefully you guys have got access to Excel. I've just created a graph in Excel. You can click on that graph, press Control and C, copy it into something like Paint, and then you can save that as a JPEG image so that you can come back and use it and link it to your map. So we can grab those graphed images like our bar chart, et cetera, et cetera, and link that directly onto our map to show this kind of how do we travel to school. So you can make a really nice, that map, nice little map around locality and travel in and around your school grounds. So what I'm going to talk about next, guys, is, is grid references and grid reference skills.
So one of those key elements that came down to key stage two in the last curriculum review were the use of four and six figure good references with your pupils. Now, I'm all going to presume that you guys are all experts at doing four and six figure good references. OK, but if you're not, we have a couple of really useful tools that will help you with grid reference, grid reference skills when you're using Digimap for schools. So I'm going to show you over on overlays. So over on the left hand panel here, we have a number of overlays. And one of those that we can actually overlay is the British National Grid System. So where we get these points and numbers and coordinates from. So this is how it's created, OK? So I'm going to give you guys a very quick explanation of how this works, OK? As you can see on the map, the country has been divided up into 100 kilometre squares. And each one of these 100 kilometre squares runs from 0 to 99 along each axis. And each one of these 100 kilometre squares has a unique two letter prefix to tell you where you are in the country. So when you're doing your grid reference work with your pupils, not only do you need to know the four or six numbers, you need to know which 100 kilometre grid square you're in for it to be an accurate grid reference. Simply because if I give you the grid reference 4162, it's in every single one of these grid squares. So you need to know which 100 kilometre grid square you're in for it to be an accurate grid reference. So if you turn this overlay on on your map, and if I go and zoom in on the Ordnance Survey HQ again, we can see on our map, guys, you get your six figure good reference around your location. So our along the corridor and up the stairs to find our good reference point. But the key thing is, well, guys, I've also got the abbreviation or which 100 kilometre grid square I'm in in this locality. So when I'm in and around the Ordnance Survey HQ, I need to prefix any grid reference I give there with that abbreviation of SU to make it an accurate grid reference. So with this overlay, you can always have that on top of your map on the screen. So when your pupils are doing their grid references, they will know which 100 kilometer square they're in and which one to prefix it with. So you can do that. You can also print your map. So if I come up to the print panel, we can also print with our national grid lines on. So if you want a physical copy to be able to print out and use it that way, you can use it that way. So you've got that lovely overlay to do it. Now, we also have another option which you can find under drawing tools. So I'm going to come up to draw and create the second tool here along from our image is our grid reference tool. So I can highlight that one, put any marker I like on it, click on the Ornate Survey HQ and it will give me the grid reference for that point. So it means you can find individual places and find the grid references for those localities. So if you're doing uh, places of interest in your location or landmarks, maybe you can give your pupils a list of landmarks and they have to go and find the grid reference for them. Or alternatively, you can give them the grid reference and they can search by grid reference. Now, the only thing to be wary of, guys, when you use the grid reference tool that we found in the drawing tools is the more accurate the map, the more accurate the grid reference will be. So if you're zoomed into a large scale map showing lots of detail, you will get a 10 figure good reference. So just make sure you find the appropriate scale for four and six figures before you start to terrorize your pupils with 10 figure good references. But it's a great, these are two nice ways to be able to link in those grid reference skills. Okay, using the overlay, doing it as I, what I'd call the proper way, along the corridor and up the stairs, or using the grid reference tool to find those places. So you can set yourself little quizzes around grid reference skills as well. And while we're talking about the overlays that I showed on here, guys, I want to show you some of the couple of really useful ones that link in some of the geography at Key Stage 2 around your world geography. So looking at the, some of the terminology you'll find in the Key Stage 2 curriculum. So I'm just going to click on my map so it zooms out to show you the extent of the world. I'm just going to delete my grid reference off. So you can see we've got two lovely views of the world. If you haven't looked at this, we've got this fantastic physical view of Bartholomew's map showing the physical um, way of showing the map. So we've got the Himalayas, we've got the Rockies and Andes. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to turn this on to Atlas mode. So then we can see the outlines of the countries and their locations. So you can actually use this as an atlas to, to find those on your map, okay? So we're gonna bring in some of the terminology that we'll find at Key Stage 2 when you need to look at some of your world geography. So one of the overlays, again, mentioned in the curriculum, are the major lines of latitude. So the terminology of the two tropics, the equator, and we can also overlay the Arctic and Antarctic circle. 
So we can overlay these on our maps to show where they are. So then you can start to do some nice geography about, you know, how many countries does the equator come through, et cetera, et cetera. So, but bringing in that wording and terminology that you'll find in the curriculum. Now, one that's really good, and if you come to one of my presentations before, I, I keep going on about this one, but it's one of my favorite ones, is the world time zones. And again, time zones are specifically mentioned at Key Stage 2 because it also introduces things like hemispheres, day and night, et cetera, et cetera. And it links in some maths as well because you've got a maths element that you could use looking at the different time zones for localities. So you've got this absolutely fantastic overlay for the time zones of the world. And let's go and find my time zone quiz. Again, guys, if you come to one of my presentations before, you may well have seen this one before, but it's such a good one. So then you can create quizzes based around your time zone map. So for instance, my first question here, if it's 12 p.m. in England, what time is it in Madagascar? So you'll first have put your geography inquiry is to find those two places on a map. So can we find those two localities? Then can we work out the different time zones? So we can count across the time zones, one, two, three, so we can work out it will be three o'clock in the afternoon in Madagascar. And then you can start to ramp up the difficulty if you wish to as well. So you can start to say if it's five o'clock in Moscow, what time is it in Vladivostok? And then we can see the vastness of Russia and its multiple time zones. And what you could also do is you could use the measurement tool to work out the distance between these places. So if we went from London down to Madagascar, how far is that in kilometers from those two points? So again, finding those points, referencing them on a map, looking at the time zone, but also looking at the distance between two points in that locality. So let's delete that one off of there. Now, the other one, another overlay we've recently just added, which again brings in some terminology found at key stage two, is the world biomes. So biomes and that particular word is mentioned in this key stage two curriculum. So we can actually view the WWF biome information for the world and their particular classifications. So we can overlay that on top of our map, as we can see here, guys. Now, what I'll do is I'll just fade the colors back a little bit so we can start to see some countries. So I've just faded the colors back so we can see them. And then we can find out those classifications, okay? So up at the top here next to our print icon, there's a little information panel or information button. So I'm going to click on that one. And I'm going to click on the Sahara Desert and it will tell me the biome information about that locality that the WWF use for their classifications. So we can see these different biomes from around the world. So if we come over now to the Amazon and click on the Amazon. We get all the biome information for that particular location as well. So if you do happen to do South America as one of your study centers, you can look at the biome information for the classifications there as well. And a really nice one as well to do, guys. Um, you can click on the user guide. I'm not going to do it because I'll open another window, but you can click on the user guide and get a very detailed breakdown of those WWF um, biome information as well. So a really nice one to link in, again, about the terminology that you can link in the key stage to. So the biomes is a really nice one as well. So two more maps I'm going to show you guys. OK, now one of those is bringing together some things at key stage two. So it's about exploring your place and location. Uh, it's about looking at routes and where we can travel. But it also brings in symbols and images. So linking all these particular things together. So let's go and zoom in on where I live because I'm going to show you my map in a second. So the idea here, guys, is to find your location. And using Ordnance Survey symbols, can we identify the Ordnance Survey symbols in our particular location? So key stage two, using Ordnance Survey symbols. So can I identify where they all are, my locality? So I've got things like I've got the um, fishing lake here. I've got the nature reserve. I can see I've got a car park. I've got a, I've got a solar panel farm over here. But I've got a footbridge. I've got an A road. I've got some minor B roads. I've got some trees here. I can see there's a school. OK, I can see there's a cross there. So we must have a church there, et cetera. So, so I have found all these symbols in my locality. So what I want to do next is I want to say, can I plan a route to go past as many of these symbols as I possibly can in a, in a circle? So very roughly, I'm going to draw this. I'll show you the finished one in a minute. So if I went 
from my house, I cross the road, come to there, cross back over, come this way. I'm going to follow the road round this way. I'm going to come up to the trees. I'm going to walk around here. I'm going to come around the back, cut through the cutway, find the school, and then make my way back to where I started. So can I work out my route that I can follow so I can go past as many of these symbols as possible? Potentially, then you can measure that to work out how far you're going to travel. And what we're going to do is because we want to understand the symbol. So we might not always understand what these symbols mean. As we go on our journey, we're going to grab an image of each of these symbols as we go past them on the map. So finally, when we've done that and brought this all together, we get what we call our symbols walk. So hopefully, let's just make that slightly smaller guys so you hopefully can see now my completed symbol symbol walk into my location so i plotted my route as you can see where i'm going to go past as many of those symbols as i possibly can i've actually measured how far i'm going to travel so we can have a, a guesstimate of how far we're going to travel to do these and i've collected images of those particular symbols so the fishing lake the nature reserve the a road coniferous trees a minor road the church uh, the footpath and the school. So a really good way to go out in your loca location, bringing together, kind of looking at where we travel, ordnance survey symbols and bringing it all together into one little practice there, going out and doing your symbol walk in your location. And one more we've got to show you guys. Now this again links into some terminology you'll find in the Key Stage 2 curriculum, which is about land use. So hopefully you've seen that in your location. Now land use is a really good geographical project to do because it gets your pupils, again, out exploring your locality, so place and location, looking at the buildings and what they're, immediate, they're used for in your immediate vicinity. So you can get them out in the classroom. You can get them collecting data and presenting data which are two parts of also key stage three and key stage four geography to give them a nice kind of foot up into that one as well. And then you can create some fantastic looking maps. So let's go and find my land use map. So this isn't my map, guys. This was one that is actually created by a school down here in Hampshire. So this is Bartley School's land use map. So what you can all, first of all, is you can work out how we're going to do this. So this was done by a group of year fives. They decided that one half of the group will go down one side of the road, one half will go down the other and look at all the buildings in the location. So before they went out, they had a discussion about how are we going to show this on a map? So introducing, again, symbolization, having a discussion about how are we going to show that information on a map when we're using a map and using symbolization. So they decided they would do it by house, bungalow, shop, pub, club and parish hall, because those were the immediate buildings they had in their vicinity. So they split into two groups. One went one side of the road, one went the other. They recorded what all the particular buildings were used for. They come back into the classroom. They pulled their information and they said, OK, how can we show this? Well, we can show this by showing one map showing all the particular land use around our locality. So it's a really nice piece of field work to do with your pupils without actually having to travel miles to do it. The UCU emphasis here was on every single building, but if you're in a location where maybe there's lots of shops, maybe the land use survey would be go out to find the different types of shops we have in the location. So could we classify them and symbolize them by the different types of shops? Now, what you could do, guys, for an extra one to add to this is you could also be out taking digital pictures of what you would perceive to be the key buildings in your location and linking those to your map for understanding. So it's a really nice way to be able to link those elements all together. Looking at land use, I said the wording's particularly mentioned at Key Stage 2, out exploring their location, a little bit of field work, collecting and presenting data to show what their land use location looks like. And these look fantastic when you print them out at A3 and put them on the wall in your classroom, or if you've got them at A4 in, in, your, in your pupils' workbooks, etc. So there's a really nice link in there. I'm going to show you one more map. I didn't have it on my list, but it's one of my favorite maps. But this is doing a little bit of cross-curricular work, guys. So I'm going to show you my Titanic map. Now, if any of you do the Titanic, here's a really good one to do. So this is introducing the world map, but this is introducing what primarily is a geography tool as a literacy tool. So using a map to tell a story. 
So where I'm based in Southampton in Hampshire, lots of schools will do the Titanic because it's one of those themes they pick up at Key Stage 1 and 2. So this is the Titanic story. So I can tell you using the map. So I can tell you where it left um, Belfast, the route that travelled on to get to Southampton, when it arrived in Southampton, when it departed on its maiden voyage, where it travelled across to Cherbourg, where it stopped in Southern Ireland, where it eventually struck the rocks, the iceberg rather, and then when it actually sunk. So using a map to tell the story. So introducing a literacy element into the geography there. So it's a nice way to be able to link that in. Now, if you've got a nice disaster, works perfectly for a nice disaster like the Titanic, okay? But it could be a story of change in your location. So can you use the map to tell a story of change? My particular favorite one is to get your pupils to tell you their story. So where have they lived? What other schools have they gone to? What secondary school are they gonna to go to? Then say, you know, can you find where your parents went to school, where they used to live? And then if you're, if their grandparents were maybe from Bangladesh or India, it's like, well, where did they travel from? So building up that story of that, that person you, uh, using a map to tell that story. So guys, unbelievably, that was 20 minutes. Okay, so I've whizzed through those in 20 minutes. We've just touched the surface with some of the things you can do using Digimap for schools. Um, I've got a couple of questions in the chat, which I will answer. So Amy said, uh, how can we use four figure references on the map? So we've got a couple of options. So it's finding places and locations. So you can do this for, which is quite a nice thing to do. So maybe you can find some major things. So if we said, let's go and find Buckingham Palace. I could spell properly, it would help. So we're going to go and find Buckingham Palace. Now we want to find the grid reference. So we've got two ways to do it. We can use the overlay with the British National Grid, do it the proper way, go along the corridor and up the stairs. Or alternatively, we can use the grid reference tool and simply click on Buckingham Palace and find the grid reference that way. So that's how we use the grid reference tool. Uh, we've also got how do you insert photos on the map? So we have a tool here, again, under draw, drawing tools where it says image. So let's pop back to the OSHQ and pop an image on the map. And find my image of the Audit Survey HQ. So I'm gonna come over to image. I get to use any of the markers I like. Click on the map where I want my image to go. Then you can either search on the hard drive of your machine or on your network. Okay, so I can then choose a file. I can find my lovely picture of the Audit Survey HQ, click on that one and upload that onto my map. So linking those images of places that way. We've also got how do we put text on? Okay, so we've got a couple of options for text, which Emma's answered in the chat, but I'll do it anyway. So we've got two options. You've got a text, we've got a text label, which we can just click on that text label, choose the color font and size, and then pop in a label that's 30 characters. Or alternatively, you can use a text box. And this time when I click on my map, I can add a text box and type an infinite amount of characters on my map. So options of how we can add text as well. So guys, I've shown you all the things that we we can do there. So do we just touch the surface? Okay, we're going to run lots of more of these webinars. Um, so we'll come up with some more ideas. There is the alternative though, guys, if you want to contact me, I'm going to put my email address in the chat that we do actually provide uh, whole school training sessions. So if you would like to have a training session to come and see how you can make best use of Digimap for schools, um, as long as you've got 15 teachers, you can come along and we can book a training session with me and I'll either run one online or come to your school and show your teachers how they can link it into both their geography, maths, history, etc. across the curriculum. So there's an option there. My email address is there. So if you want to drop me an email, please do. I'm just looking at the questions. Emma's on top of them all, answering them all as well. So that's good. So guys, if you've got any questions, please pop them in the chat. The only other thing I'm gonna show you is a super resource that we've added to the website. Now, the Geographical Association, who are the subject association for geography, um, have annual awards. And fortunately, one of our resources has just won one of their GA awards. So this is a fantastic resource that you'll find under learning resources under help and resource. And if you're, new, you're a geography coordinator, 
you should definitely 100% have a look at this resource. So it's under using Digimap for schools, and it's the one that says pupil for planning, uh, planning for pupil progress from year from year five to eleven. So this has been written by a specialist primary school teacher. Not only does this link into your curriculum creation to cover your key stage one and key stage two uh, geography. Also brings in progression, how you can progress using map skills and maps throughout key stage one and key stage two. And it also links fantastically into the new Ofsted framework of what they will come to look at if they come and do Ofsted at your school, particularly looking for geography. So if you get the opportunity to download this particular document, guys, go and download it. It's free to access. It's a fantastically useful piece of um, documentation looking at primary map skills. So guys, have you got any more? Yeah, how did you color the buildings on the land use map? I will show you that. Let's go and log back in. There is a nice video that shows you how to do this. And it will take a little bit more care than I will in two seconds time. So what we're going to use to color in the buildings, we're going to use what we call a polygon drawing tool. So we can come over to the button here under draw and create that says shape. I can choose my outside line and the style and the thickness and a fill color. So I can color different buildings, different colors. So I'm gonna highlight around the tennis court, just click and release the click and very roughly just draw around the tennis courts as they are on the map there. So we can use that polygon drawing tool to highlight specific buildings in a location. So it's quite simple to do and you can choose your, your fill setting as well. So we can change the fill setting and then do a different building if we wish. So around the football ground this time. So we can do our land use map using that simple polygon drawing tool to highlight those particular buildings. Any more questions, guys? No? Make sure you go and have a look at the Twitter link as well. Lots and lots of teachers are, are sending us uh, Twitter ideas of how they're using the service. Um, it seems to be the media that most people want to be able to use to tell us how they're doing it. So go and have a look at the Twitter link. It's found at the bottom of the page. OK, we're getting lots and lots of primary teachers tweeting and telling us how they're using it in the classroom. So there's some fantastic peer to peer examples of how it's actually being used by Key Stage 1, Key Stage 2 pupils. OK, so go and have a look at these. I'm pretty sure you'll be able to take some of these ideas and run with them yourself. And what I'll do, guys, I'm going to turn this back on you. If you're, a, if you're a Digimap School user and you use it with your pupils and it works in a fantastic way, tweet and tell us about it so we can share that idea with the rest of the Digimap for Schools community as well. So we'd like to build on those peer-to-peer -peer ideas and get as many of these up and running as we possibly can. <laughs>